I never told my parents that I saw my brother being taken. It was one of my first memories. I was four years old and my few recollections from this time are mostly hazy. This was sharp in detail. I was feeling upset because I thought no one cared about me. There was a tremendous energy in the house. It was very quiet and I was standing in a doorway looking into a small room. I could hear my parents speaking. They were in another room. My newborn brother was in a cot in the small room. The window was open. It was dark outside. I remember how the white paint on the frame was cracked and the cold had a smell of its own. Then, they came. They were a fog, drifting through the open window. Something was moving inside the fog, tendrils of twisting gray that, for a moment, resembled a hand, a face. Do you remember lying on your back on a summer's day and finding shapes in the clouds? It was night and suddenly freezing in the room and the fog was reaching out over the cot, reaching in, and my brother, a tiny swaddled baby, was lifted out. The fog wrapped around him. That was the last time I had ever seen him, to this day. I stood there, my skin tingling with fear, and watched as another baby tumbled gently out of the fog and into the cot. And then the fog slipped away, taking my brother with it. The room was just a room again. I walked over to the cot and looked in at the new baby. It looked just like my brother. I heard voices behind me, my parents. They came into the room, ruffled my hair. My mom kissed my cheek as if nothing was wrong and asked me if I wanted to hold my brother. I never told them. I came close many times, but then I thought, perhaps it was just my imagination. Or some kind of waking dream. Only, when Carl was five and I was nine, we were out playing in a stream near our house. It was more like a muddy puddle that had spread down channels in the dirt we had made for it. But in our imaginations, it was a place for great adventures. Pirate ships defeating the Nazis, liberating the magic treasure, only to be dive-bombed and sank by being tipped onto their side. You've lost, I said. You've lost. Carl was the pirate king. He looked up at me, sullen face. His eyes were dark, darker than mine had ever been, darker than my parents, darker than my brothers would have been. He stared at me, and there was a coldness in his eyes as well that made my bladder weaken. His hand shot out and he slapped me vicious, hard, in the face. I was so shocked, I could not breathe. I was twelve, Carl was eight. Our grandparents had come over because it was my birthday and we were in the back garden. The barbecue was heating up nicely. Dad was standing over it, weighing up when would be the perfect moment to place the burgers on the grill. The neighbors had come over to say hello, and Mom was chatting with them. Her hair was tied back, 
there was a red mark on her cheek where a mosquito had bitten her two days before. I was drinking a ginger beer and pretending it was real beer. I was staggering around like I was drunk and bumped on purpose into Carl. Sorry, I pretend slurred. He considered me, looked around the garden. His eyes were cold, dark pools. He walked slowly up to the barbecue. Dad turned his back just for a moment to get some more coals. I could see the heat haze from the grill. Thought the burgers will cook nicely. Carl reached out and put the palm of his hand on the grill. He looked at me and smiled, then began to scream. Have you ever smelt burning flesh? These are snapshots, memories, moments in time captured. There are many more that led up to today. Today is Dad's 50th birthday. I am 21. Carl is 18. Mom has arranged a surprise brunch party. In the evening, friends were coming over for beer and food. This morning, the house is full of noise. Laughter. Dad's parents are downstairs, his brother, his cousins, who have driven for two days just to be here. I was in my room, getting changed into smarter clothes than the t-shirt and joggers I had been wearing. I wanted to get into the spirit of the occasion. Carl was in his room as well. There had been no sign of him so far today. Music drifted up from the breakfast room where the party was. Old style heavy rock, dad's favorite. I was wondering if a tie was a step too far when I heard Carl's bedroom door click open. Listen to his steps as he descended the stairs. The laughter and buzz of chat continued. Then suddenly, the music was cranked up. I felt the noise, the vibration of it. Then, as suddenly as it had been ramped up, the music ended. There was silence. I felt lightheaded with dread, with the anticipation of what I would find as I made my way down the stairs. Carl stood in the hallway outside the breakfast room. He looked to be in a daze. What have you done now, you freak? I shouted. Carl looked at me and said, I don't belong here. I was substituted for the thing that did. But you know that. You always have. I am a changeling. A creature of wonder, born in a land far, far away, and brought here by my kind my kin. People call us fairies. I thought of stories I had read, of movies I had seen, of gossamer wings, fragile beauty, lights shimmering in the air. Not this. Carl, staring at me with his cold, dark eyes. I told him he was a crazy SOB and added more of my opinion for good measure. Fairies do good deeds. They don't screw with you. He considered this for a moment before replying. Sometimes we just want to make people smile. And with that, he was gone. He just 
slipped away. Damn. I swallowed. I steeled myself and went into the still, silent breakfast room. Blood pooled on the tabletop, obscenely coated a stack of pancakes, dripped onto the floor. The family were all there. They stared blindly ahead, their throats cut, the flesh around their mouths sliced open into gaping, grotesque grins. What do I remember next? I remember touching my mom's face. Her skin was warm, was slick with blood. I rested my head on her shoulder, whispered, Please, no. I remember stumbling out onto the street, collapsing onto my knees and beginning to weep. My mouth was open. I wanted to scream, but I had no voice. A neighbor from across the road emerged an old man. He looked confused, concerned. Then he must have seen the blood that had ended up on me because he turned and hurried back inside. I remember the sirens. An ambulance first. The paramedics crouching beside me, telling me their names, asking me mine. Then the first police car. I remember bursts of distorted voices as radios crackled, a conversation between two policemen and a paramedic. I don't know if they knew I could hear them. They were talking about whether I should be handcuffed before I was taken to the hospital. I was not shackled as I was led into the ambulance, but a policeman rode with me. At the hospital, I was cleaned up, given a gown and a couple of pills to swallow, then left in a small room by myself. It was nearly evening, I think, before two detectives arrived and asked me what had happened. I had nothing to hide, so I walked them through it as best I could. It was my dad's 50th birthday. My mom had arranged a surprise brunch. Dad's parents, brother, a couple of cousins from out of state were there. The house had been filled with laughter and music. Only then, it wasn't it. It was silent. I made my way downstairs and saw him, Carl, standing in the hall. I repeated what he had said to me then. It sounded insane, but I told the detectives. He said that he had been switched at birth for my brother, that he was a fairy, a thing called a changeling, and that I knew this, always had. They took this in their stride, both writing in small notebooks. I had called him crazy, I told them. Then he had slipped away. They asked me if I knew where he might have gone, I did not, and with that, the detectives left. They did not ask me about Carl. I guessed they had looked his record up, spoken to his teachers and social workers. They knew. I was 21, Carl three years younger than me. Throughout his life, if he was challenged or left out, he reacted, slapping me across the face if I won a childhood game deliberately burning himself by placing a hand on a searing hot grill at a barbecue for my birthday. Once, after flunking an exam, the next day the backpack Carl brought to school stank, an intense, rancid smell. A teacher unzipped it and looked inside. A dead fox stared back up at him. Its eye sockets were empty, until maggots, fat on their gorging, emerged through them, wriggling into the light. That led to Carl's first expulsion from a school. More followed. There was counseling, court orders, spells in the children's psychiatric units, but nothing stopped him. I sat in the room at the hospital by myself and thought how now he had crossed a line. He had brutally killed mom and dad, 
Dad's brother, his parents, and cousins as they celebrated Dad's birthday, slitting their throats as they ate pancakes in the breakfast room, then mutilating their faces. Remembering this made me feel sick. I managed to get to my feet and headed out into the hallway. I asked the first person I saw if they could help me, and then I must have passed out. I woke up in a bed on a ward. I was told it was a psychiatric unit and that they wanted me to stay in for a few days. A week later, and I was still a patient when the detectives returned, they told me that after an intense police search, they had found my brother Carl living rough and dense forest five miles from the city, and he had been charged with multiple counts of homicide. He is not my brother, I said. Sure, kid, they replied, exchanging knowing glances. The changeling. Yes, the changeling. I got angry. He is not my brother. I yelled over and over again. A nurse came with a sedative. I don't remember the detectives leaving. A few days later, I was discharged. I had nowhere else to go, so went back home. It was taped off, guarded by a patrol car with two bored-looking officers inside. They offered to take me to a nearby motel and lent me the money to pay for the first night. I cried when they did this. There's something more. Something I did not tell the police. And that I never told my parents. Lying on the bed in the motel room the next morning, I thought again about that day. I was four years old. My brother, a newborn, in his cot. I was feeling put out as everyone was fussing over the baby. My parents were in another room and I was alone looking at the cot when a fog drifted into the room and I watched in dumb confusion as the fog swooped down and took the baby and another baby tumbled out of the fog and into the cot. Moments later, my parents returned. The fog had gone. The baby appeared identical the day went on as if nothing had happened. I never told my parents because I always questioned if what I had seen was real. And now I never would. Carl, the changeling, had taken them from me. I was spiraling into depression when there was a knock on the door. Assuming it was the cops, I went to answer. I was surprised to see a woman dressed in a smart business suit standing there. Hi, she said brightly. I'm Samantha Cooper, your brother's attorney. Please don't take what I share next in the wrong way. I was 21 years old and she was beautiful. In her early 30s, long auburn hair, and she smelled good. Hell, she smelled good. So instead of telling her to get lost because Carl was not my brother, I invited her in. I perched on the end of the bed. She stood. I was suddenly aware of the stale smell in the small room, painfully aware that a lot of it was coming from me. I was wearing thrift clothes from the hospital and had not showered for I could not remember how long. Have I mentioned that she was beautiful? So, she began, breaking what was becoming an uncomfortable pause. I have been appointed by the state to defend your brother. What has happened is a tragedy, and to be straight with you, a lot of people have already made their minds up. But no matter how difficult a past your brother has had, everyone deserves a fair trial, and I will do everything in my power to ensure that happens. She paused and took a breath. I had a feeling she had practiced that little speech and was relieved it was out of the way. I considered telling her she was wasting her time, that Carl was a grade-A psycho and a maximum security cell was the best place for him to spend the rest of his damned life. Only she smiled at me. Wow. Carl, she continued as I appeared to have been struck dumb, says that he did not kill anyone. He seems disoriented, somewhat distant, which is in some ways understandable, considering the circumstances. 
One thing he has been clear on, though, was when I was trying to talk to him about the events leading up to the killing, I mentioned his brother being in the house, and he looked straight at me and said, I want to see him. So, what do you say? It could help, and at this moment in time, your brother needs all the help he can get. Once, I thought. I will see him once, to tell him face to face that I hate him, and I hope he burns. I kept this to myself. I nodded. Okay, I said. I will see Carl. The next day, a taxi collected me, and Samantha met me at the prison entrance. I had showered, though the lukewarm water had made me feel slimy instead of clean, and I had no new clothes to change into. There is no mention of a dress code among the many warning signs we passed as we went through the signing-in process. Luckily, I thought bitterly. Finally, we were led into what looked like a run-down office. We have an hour, Samantha told me as she took documents, a pad and pen out of her briefcase, and laid them on a table. So let's not rush or pressure Carl. It would be ideal if he feels he can open up because you're here. I bit my tongue. She had no idea. The door clicked open and a man was led inside, flanked by two guards. His ankles, his wrists were shackled. These were taken off while Samantha watched, arms crossed. The guards left. Good to see you again, Carl, Samantha said. Would you like to sit down? Carl ignored her. He was looking at me. His eyes were brown, a soft, deep brown. The Carl I had grown up with had cold, dark eyes, the eyes of a twisted, sick individual. The eyes of a killer in waiting. This man was not Carl. And yet he looked like him in every other way. What is it? Samantha asked. I could not explain it to myself, let alone to anyone else. This was not my one and only visit after all. I went as often as I was allowed over the months that followed. Sometimes with Samantha, sometimes on my own. Very little had been said during that initial visit, and much as Samantha tried to get out of me on the way back to the motel what was wrong, she was still in the dark when she dropped me off. It took time for the man I met for the first time that day to tell me his story and for me to begin to understand. He was my real brother and he had been put through a nightmare ordeal. After each meeting I made notes. From these I think it is best for my brother to tell his own story now. He told me it in fragments. I have been scared my entire life. I have felt alone and knew that I was different. I lived in a ramshackle hut made of scraps of wood deep in a forest. The canopy of the trees was thick and I lived even in the hottest days in shadow. Fat flies and grubs would come into my hut and settle on my skin. I would pick them off and eat them. I would doze and dream. I dreamt of my hut and the forest and the skirting insects. Of the others, I do not know if they were part of my dream, if they came in my sleep or they came in the real. They were tiny creatures, not much bigger than one of the bees which I used to watch hovering over the forest floor. They wore leaves and painted their faces with mud. They chattered constantly among themselves. That's how I knew when they were coming. The growing hum of their voices and the fluttering of their wings. 
apart from these translucent things on their backs. They had the features of a person. They seemed to be ageless, though sometimes when I looked at them they appeared young. Could almost have been children. Their laughter cascading through the forest. Sometimes their faces were old, wrinkled, and when they smiled their toothless maws were dark cavities. They brought me things, racks to wear, toys to play with, a broken plastic spade which I dug listlessly in the soil with, a doll. Its covering had burst and its dusty guts spilled out when I squeezed. They brought me books as well, old and torn picture books. They would point at these and read to me from them. This was how I learned about everything that was not my hut and the bugs I ate and the bugs I watched and the trees and the dirt from which the trees grew. They were not cruel to me. They never struck me. They came and they went, and I felt alone and scared and different. Until one day I heard new voices in the forest. These were deep and urgent. They brought light and anger, and when they discovered me in my hut, they dragged me from it. They told me what I had done. Terrible things. They told me who I was, used a name I had never heard before. Carl. I cried out to the winged beings to come and save me, but they did not. They abandoned me and let the people bring me here to this place where there are no trees sheltering, no shadows to settle in beneath. There is a lot more said in the times we spent alone together. But this was the heart of it. I did not share any of this information with Samantha. Any person who had not lived through what I had would regard my brother's words as delusional. Other people can think what they want. I knew what I believed. Ed knew what I had to do. I told my brother at the end of our last meeting that it would be a few weeks before I could visit again. That I had to go away for a short while. I would see him soon and would have good news. I fought to hold in my emotions as I headed back along the seemingly never-ending corridors and gates that led out of the prison. I walked out back onto the street and took a deep breath. My mind was made up. I was going to go into the forest, deep, deep into the forest, where my brother had been found by the police search team and I would find proof of the changeling's existence, of my brother's innocence. I set off before dawn. I had a backpack with water, chocolate, dried fruit, a torch, a sleeping bag. I caught a bus to the outskirts of the city, and from there I walked. When this plan was forming, I had asked Samantha to show me on a map where the police found my brother. Just curious was how I had answered when she asked me why. I followed the directions on my phone. There were no paths apart from the ones I made stumbling over branches and skirting trees. Although it was only mid-morning, soon the overhanging canopy of the forest cut out most of the natural light. Then disaster struck. Well, more the curse of relying on your phone for everything. I had no signal. I was confident I still knew which direction to head in and how far I had to go. I just needed to walk in a fairly straight line. A few hours later, and I did not feel so sure. The forest seemed to have gotten denser and denser, and every way I turned looked identical. There was nothing to tell me I was heading in the right direction, nothing to let me know if I was walking in circles. For my brother, I told myself, and hurried on, which was a bad mistake. I did not see the vine which trapped my ankle, and I went over with a crash. Pain shot up my leg. Damn, damn, damn! I picked myself up, tried to stand. New waves of pain forced me to sit, my back to a tree. I checked my phone. 
I had one bar. Heart racing, I tried to phone 911, but the signal went again before I was connected. I put the phone down, closed my eyes, rested my head on the cool, hard bark. I must have slept because when I opened my eyes, the forest was in full darkness. I could not even see my own hands or feet. Within seconds of coming awake, the intense pain from my ankles told me I still had limbs. I fumbled around and found my backpack, switched on the torch. Within moments, its beam of light was manic with insects. No. Not insects, I saw. But slim, winged beings that were considering me with their cold, dark eyes. I began to scream. Looking back, recording this, I now know I was having a nervous breakdown. The murder of my family, the way everything I had known had been ripped from under me, the puzzle of my brother which kept me awake night after night had proved too much for me. At the time, the unstoppable torrent of emotions came at me faster and faster. The winged beings were swooping closer and closer. I could hear their laughter, felt their spit striking my face like freezing, biting rain. I clawed at the air, trying to drive them away. I begged and begged for them to leave me alone, and then, with a sudden rushing intensity, I felt as if I was falling into a place I had been a long time ago. I was four years old, and I knew that this was what had really happened. The barriers I had created, the false memories, were shattering around me. I was four years old. I was feeling upset because I thought no one cared about me. There was a tremendous energy in the house. It was very quiet and I was standing in the doorway looking into a small room. I could hear my parents speaking. They were in another. My newborn brother was in a cot in the small room. The window was open. It was dark outside. I remember how the white paint on the frame was cracked and the cold had a smell of its own. I remember thinking how much better it all was before he came. That if he went away, things could go back. Mom and Dad would love me with all their hearts again. I remember walking into the small room and looking at my brother. I reached down and placed my hand over his mouth and nose and held it there till he stopped moving. Then I left, went back into my bedroom. Soon after that, my mom screamed and I listened as over the next few hours, people came and went. I watched the ambulance lights through the curtains of my bedroom window and thought how pretty they were. Over the years that followed, I picked up what my parents believed, that my brother had stopped breathing because of natural causes. I never told them what I did. My brother stopped breathing for over a minute before my dad managed somehow to get his heart beating again, and this caused brain damage that displayed itself in its destructive, violent behavior. Sitting there alone in the forest, I remembered. I remembered the truths I had hidden from myself. I made my brother different. It was I who changed him. And then, in my warped imagination, I made Carl into the changeling. I used to mock him when we were both still very small, telling him again and again that he was different, that he did not belong, provoking him into one of his rages. The first time he hurt me badly, I stopped. 
but by that stage, Carl's course in life was set. I sat alone in the forest, and I heard voices in the distance. Rescuers. It turned out my phone had made a connection and the emergency services had found me. I was carried out of the forest. I said nothing. My secrets, my actions, were burning inside of me. Eventually, we reached the ambulance waiting on the edge of the forest. At that moment, I wanted to die. I had not found proof of my brother, Carl's innocence. Instead, I had discovered my guilt. He would still spend the rest of his life in prison, though, once he was found guilty of the murders, as he surely would. A light was showing on my phone. I had a voicemail. Listlessly, I pressed play. It was Samantha. Her voice was bright as ever as she began to speak, and I felt an overwhelming sadness. I have found evidence the state has been sitting on, she said, and we have new grounds for hope, a new argument I can and will make in court at your brother's trial. There was a pause then. I imagined Samantha catching her breath, wanting to stay always professional. And her voice was calm, level. When she tore my world once more apart. There was DNA found in the house that does not match your family. Whoever else was in there that day was not your brother.